This is Wretched Radio with Todd Friel. This is Wretched Radio. What do we do with those old people in church? <laughs> One church's decision getting a lot of attention. This is Wretched Radio to Cottage Grove, Minnesota. We go. That was the theme song to Golden Girls. I didn't know it either. <laughs> that was an Andrew Gold song, wasn't it? Why is, wait a second. Why is, Thank you for being Why is a woman singing this song? Because it because was a theme song to Golden Girls. Right. But it was, I think because it was a, re- that was a it, hit on the radio by yeah. a guy named Andrew Gold, who also did Lonely Boy, if I'm not mistaken. Can no. I just, can we just stop this program for a second so I can sit in a corner and just weep? I'm having flashbacks. That I know any of that. Ike, Viltafish, Larry. All right, he's got 1.8 million views on the on the YouTube machine. I was right. Andrew Gold was the original singer of Thank You for Being a Friend. <laughs> and I'm you trying win? to memorize Colossians 3, 12 through 14. <laughs> Thank you for being a friend. That sounds great. <laughs> Cottage Grove, Minnesota, making perhaps one of... The biggest public goofs in a long time. Please note the pastor at that church complaining, hey, I'm not being fairly represented. You be the judge on that. It seems to me, uh, while there may be some errors in the reporting in the newspaper, it does happen. Nevertheless, it seems that they have desired to try to keep the church alive and youthful and vibrant by basically firing the old people. Here are the details. Well, not this so is... much firing as well, what do you pushing them out. It? Okay. <laughs> and again, in fairness, the pastor's going, no, 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 no. We, we didn't push them out. Well, it does seem that this is what they call it what you will. This is what it appears happened at this Methodist church in Cottage Grove. They have two campuses. You need to note that. The campus in Cottage Grove is not flourishing as a couple dozen people. They're all 60 plus with the exception of one family where the parents are 34 years old. In other words, they are facing what many churches are facing in this country. That's probably the important oomph to this particular story. Nevertheless, they brought in a church growth guru. Uh Uh-oh, that's always the first mistake. Who said, what we need to do if we're gonna attract the youth is to have the old people stop attending, go to the other campus where they'll kind of blend in a little bit, and then in six months, we'll reopen. And by the way, it seems that in the meantime, they still want them to keep giving and mowing the lawn and the shoveling the sidewalk. Yeah. yeah. So the, the old people can do that. And then in the fall, they plan on reopening. No old people. And then the youth will come. And then after 15 to 18 months, the old people who had to go to the other service in the other location could reapply with the pastor to see if they could come back to church. Wow, wow, wow. Now, okay, so as the pastor say, I'm confused here. Th- well, the what's... pastor's saying, well, now it's not quite like that exactly. We didn't push them out, but Uh-oh. those seem to be the details. Whatever they happen to be, the moral to the story is this church is not unique. What is a church to do when it appears it's dying? What does a church do when it's the demographic is, whoa, we have very few, that we can't keep going because once everybody here no longer can attend church or dies, this church will go with it. Well, here's my first question. And now, and, and please, please note, I, I don't intend to say this like, well, that's pretty casual and easy for you to say, pal. It's our church. We built it with our own hands. We put in time and money. I understand that. I, I, I can't help but think, though, at least one option for some churches is that they're going to, and, and no fault of their own. The community, the, you can have a, you can have, let's just say it's a place where farming is not big anymore and all the kids are leaving. I mean, they're, they're not going anywhere. It could be that some circumstances, a church can't keep going when this demographic, when they leave us, it just can't. That is an option. So the question, though, is what do we do about it? How do we keep the church healthy, 
youthful, and alive? Wrong question, wrong question, wrong question. Those are pragmatic questions that will inevitably lead to what we have seen in the seeker-sensitive movement. This is precisely what was being addressed decades ago when we decided to go out into the public and ask people in the neighborhood, hey, what would you like our little local church to be so that you'll come? In other words, the church, which is supposed to be a lifeboat, started using Folgers coffee cans, because they had really bad coffee then too, and just pouring the world into the boat. And what's going to happen? It's going to sink. And it's not going to be the type of church that Jesus wants by asking, what do we do to make this thing a success? It's, it's, it's inevitably going to lead to a wrong end. Now, having said that, is there anything wrong with asking, okay, what, what can we do to be a light in this community? That's a different question. Here's a different question, even more perhaps poignant than that one. How does Jesus want us to do church? That's the question. And I think that's the first one that needs to be answered. How does Jesus want us to do church? Because if we turn this church into something that merely attracts a particular demographic, then we might become what he doesn't want and he might not be pleased with what we're doing. And have we not seen enough of that fruit? Really, have we not seen enough? The, the, these gross-out games that the youth groups do, th this is precisely where these came from. What do we need to do to get the kids here? And we decided we're going to play banana barf. Kids put a banana in their mouth, then you put a nylon stocking on their head. They have to somehow spew the banana through the nylon stocking. And then when they take the stocking off, it smears all over their face and everybody laughs. And if you think I'm making that up, Google it yourself. And that is precisely the way they describe it. Everybody, Joey, no, please. I've not done that, but I've seen it done multiple times. Okay. The standard, that, that's where this leads when we ask the wrong question. What do we need to do to get the kids there? Well... <laughs> First of all, I don't think banana barf is, is going to do it for long. Furthermore, was talking to young Jack here at Wretched. Jack is, he just turned 19. And, and I was mentioning banana barf, and he's like, <sighs> he just looked like he just had some sort of flashback to, to, to a war that he didn't want to be in. I went to youth group, and that's the type of stuff that they did, and I just hated it. I hated it. And then when we finished doing these, these, these silly games, Okay, so now we're going to talk about Jesus. Yo! Yo, yo, yo! Okay, everybody, calm down. Okay, so here's the story. I'm going to keep this quick, so don't worry. What, where did that come from? Asking the wrong question. Do I recognize that if we simply do church the way that Jesus wants us to do it, that no kids might come? Yes, I do. Do I realize that a church could die out if we do it the way that our kids God wants us to do it? Yeah, yes, I, I, I do realize that. But we need to resolve that question. We need, to, we need to answer it. What is church? Who gets to run the church? Who makes these decisions? Do I understand the heart behind it? I do. I really do. But I just think it's misguided, and it's a wrong sense of what church is supposed to be about. It is supposed to be an assembling of the saints. This is where the wheat gets together. And when we invite in the tares, you are just inviting in all kinds of problems. And it, the cliche is true. What you win them with, you got to keep them with. And then you got to amp it up even more. Otherwise, they get bored with it. And so we have seen this question asked and answered a thousand times. And when you look at the squishy evangelical movement and wonder, how did this happen? I would suggest to you one of the ways, in fact, perhaps one of the major ways, was by asking the wrong question. What do we do to keep the church alive? <gasps> We're going down in membership. Uh-oh, what do we do? Wrong, wrong, wrong. What does Jesus want? Answer that. Resolve that. And then I do believe it's fair to say, so how do we let the world know about this? Not so that we can keep the church alive, not so that we can grow the place, but because we want them to enjoy Jesus too. We don't want them floundering. We don't want them perishing. We don't want their families being the shipwreck that so many of them are. We want better for them. Let's go find them. But that's totally different than what, okay, so what do we need to do to get people here? 
It's a different question, and it's a different motivation. And even though I'm quite certain people who have asked the question, what do we need to do to grow the church, have been correctly motivated, I'm, I'm sure that that's the case. Nevertheless, it will never, ever deliver the results that they were hoping for. And you will ultimately build, if these, if these methodologies work, a center that maybe attracts, entertains, and amuses people, or it becomes a social network center, but it will never be the church that Jesus wants it to be. What do we do with this story in Cottage Grove? Well, we'll, we'll let them folks work those details out and get the facts straight. But let us learn the lesson of the seeker-sensitive movement. Let's stop asking the wrong question. What do we do to keep this place alive? How do we grow this place? And start asking the question that Jesus wants us to ask. Lord, what do you want your church to be? And he will bless that whether the doors stay open or not. This is Wretched Radio.